archaeology confirms the Bible, and even archaeologists will tell you that the mm-hmm. Bible is the best resource for using history mm-hmm. to find ancient civilizations. That's why I agree with James K. Smith that you have to love mm-hmm. before you can know. Mm-hmm. That the more I love God, the more I know about Him, the more I understand archaeology, the more I understand social sciences of faith development, the more I understand faith stages. Hey there, I'm Matthew Foley and this is ISO Insights, where God's truth grows in the midst of current culture, renewing the mind and spirit. I, uh, when reading your volume one, (laughs) it it kind of blew my mind because uh, I've been on a trip. I've been blessed by the Lord to be on a trip over to Israel, an archaeological trip, actually, with a group called ABR, Associates for Biblical Research. Um, And Scott Stripling, he's the director over that group, in case you want to look them up. But they, uh, it's a just a group of Christians and uh, conservative individuals coming. And the vast majority of, I want to jump into archaeology now because you mentioned that. This is one specific example of a field where you see liberal domination, but the data is not best interpreted in an anti-biblical way. The, the Bible actually is the most comfortable interpretation for the data, but people are resisting that in the field of archaeology. It's everywhere. It, when, and I, uh, I saw that uh, in your book, you had mentioned the scroll, this, uh, this, this ancient scroll that was detailing, and right now I looked it up, they said that it's possibly in the Middle Kingdom age of yeah. Egypt, but uh, they're, they're trying to push it back to earlier datings, but it's at least dated to right before the time of King David, so it's right before 1000 BC, mm-hmm. um, and it's describing the actual plagues of Egypt. Well, yes. I had never heard of that. Mm-hmm. I had never heard of this scroll in mm-hmm. college. But if, if you look up mainstream archaeological texts, mm-hmm. what they're going to say about they're never going to bring up the Exodus. They're mm-hmm. never, they're, they, they'll, on Wikipedia, they'll touch it, but mm-hmm. they'll say, but this is likely a poetic. This, mm-hmm. is, right. this is likely properly interpreted as a poetic tale about struggling mm-hmm. in Egypt and uh, famine that was breaking out in the land. But it's literally mentioning, if you take it literally, it's mentioning points of the, uh, the different plagues that hit Egypt, rivers of blood, the Nile, the river of blood, the Nile, it mentions darkness in the land, there being no Mm -hmm. light. So when I saw how you pointed that out in volume one of Lethal Faith, I was shocked Mm -hmm. because it rarely, first of all, how much research did you have to put in to find all these different documents? Years. But I want to make something, I want to make a definitive statement. The idea, now modern liberal archaeology, okay, I I may give you that, but archaeology as a science from the 1800s when Mm -hmm. it started, Everyone from, um, from Sir William Ramsey to uh, Nelson Gluck, one of the most famous archaeologists on the cover of Time magazine, all along with the Oriental Training Center for Archaeology mm-hmm. and every reputable archaeological training academic institution have all said that the Bible has never been controverted mm-hmm. by a biblical or excuse me, the Bible has never been controverted by an archaeological find. Mm -hmm. Now, there are times that we will say there's a discrepancy here. I don't believe the Hittites uh, lived, and uh, the Hittites um, are only mentioned in the Scriptures. And for hundreds of years, and this is a great, great point you've made here, for hundreds of years, people rejected Jesus and the Bible, including Mm -hmm. Charles uh, Templeton, who was Billy Graham's best friend, who Mm -hmm. preached to 30, 40, 50,000 people in the 30s, Mm -hmm. left his faith because he judged his faith based on the science available to him at this time. Had he lived today, I believe he'd been a Christian. Wow. uh, And stayed a Christian, I should Mm -hmm. say. Would not have apostated. So... Archaeology confirms the Bible, and even archaeologists will tell you that the mm-hmm. Bible is the best resource for using history mm-hmm. to find ancient civilizations. Wow. And I think I saw that. I saw a look in your eye when I, when I was making the statement. Yeah. You were like, now let's not say <laughs> liberalism <laughs> is, is dominating the field. Um, and the reason I'd say it is because if, if I go on to the Smithsonian, uh-huh. I'll find one way of looking at it. Right. There, there won't be a pro-biblical perspective. Oh, absolutely. So I'm thank, thank, glad that you said that mm-hmm. because um, you don't, as a student in the United States, you won't hear this side of the story. But That's there right. are schools internationally that do teach mm-hmm. biblical archaeology. Or the beginning, Matthew, the, the, real, the issue here is really the beginning and the foundation of archaeology mm-hmm. because the foundation of archaeology really is biblical archaeology. Mm-hmm. Uh, even amongst atheists like Sir William Ramsey, you know, 
And he, he uh, set out to disprove the book of Acts and disprove the book of Luke and said he, Luke was one of the best historians he's ever met in his life. And he's still revered, along with people like uh, Burroughs at Yale. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, archaeology confirms the Bible. An archaeologist, um, most of them are not believers, which is amazing to me. Uh, many of them aren't. Mm-hmm. But it is confirming the Bible more and more and more and more. And they use the Bible as a historical document. Mm-hmm. And I've traveled with, you know, uh, around the world, Turkey and, and uh, Jerusalem and different places for, for months at a time with archaeologists. And every one of them, including the Muslims, will have a Bible in their back pocket. Really? Just for the, you mean just no, because you, of the trade that they well, have no, to have you, research? You, you, Matthew, you're walking through the ruins of Pergama. Mm-hmm. And the altar of Satan, at least the foundation is there. The actual thing is in Germany in Berlin at the Pergamon Museum. But the altar of Satan is there, and they'll pull out a Bible, mm-hmm. and they'll talk about it. Really? Wow. And these are Muslim archaeologists. <laughs> so is this just a, a spiritual battle? I mean, that's an obvious question because Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Mm-hmm. But uh, this this tendency to uh, – there was um, one – Place that was found. Oh my goodness! Well, I can't remember the the actual name, but they excavated this area in Egypt, and it perfectly fit the description of Goshen. Oh no, perfectly absolutely! Fitted. No, you're talking yeah. about. Uh, and see, that's the problem with Egypt. Egypt and the Exodus has always been the Achilles' heel of Scripture, mm-hmm. and that's no longer that way because. When archaeologists began to dig underneath the land of Ramsey, because that's what Moses says. Moses said, you know, in the land of Ramses. Well, mm-hmm. he did that 800 years after the mm-hmm. events. Um, I think it's 800 years. But anyway, he um, was using a term uh, that was still used at his time. Ramsey was the most famous of, of the Egyptian pharaohs. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, we actually have his mummy. Yeah. It's one of the only bodies really? we have from the Bible. <laughs> Actually, he had red hair, which is mm-hmm. fascinating. So he, uh, they said, aha, if the Bible is true and we dig underneath the land of Ramses, then we should find destruction mm-hmm. because of the plagues. But we did find destruction. We found prosperity. But if you move that back to the Middle Kingdom, mm-hmm. you find death, you find graveyards full of children, mm-hmm. you find people who were extremely healthy, and then now all of a sudden uh, have rickets mm-hmm. and arthritis and diseases that are more common towards slavery. It's almost like someone went from yeah. from from prosperity to slavery. And that whole archaeological community now has found what they believe is the foundation of the house of Joseph. Mm -hmm. Had 12 pillars. pillars, And they also had um, uh, 12 graveyards in the back. Mm -hmm. One was pyramid. And I just finished studying Egyptology. with was one of the leading Egyptologists in the world. And one of the things I learned is you cannot be buried in an Egyptian pyramid without having... The power of Pharaoh. Now, you would have a safety wrap uh, on your shoulders, like a mark, that would show that you have the authority of Pharaoh, but you're not going to get buried in a pyramid unless you are extremely close and have the power of a Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And so there's a pyramid in the backyard of this house Uh that we now believe is probably Joseph. Mm -hmm. And inside there, they found a statue. Anytime you find a statue in archaeology especially in Egypt, and it has a bow haircut. Mm -hmm. It means it's Semitic, which is the origins of our Jewish people. And so Mm -hmm. it has a Semitic haircut, most certainly, and it has a satrap on Mm -hmm. it. And the paint is still there, Matthew, and it has a coat of many colors. So (laughs) there is a statue of a man, of an individual, Mm -hmm. who is Semitic, who has a coat of many colors inside the pyramid in the backyards of what we now wow. know, the land of Goshen. And didn't they, I remember, uh, watched a documentary about this years ago, yeah. uh, just a few years ago, but didn't they say the bones had been taken? And, and uh, they said that it looked as though they had been intentionally removed from mm-hmm. that tomb. And of course, in the biblical account, Joseph actually made them uh, promise. He said, you're going to remove my bones if you go back to the land of our fathers mm-hmm. and carry them with you. And it says Moses actually did it when he left. He had the bones removed. So that was even more evidence that was lining up with the Bible. I, I also believe he was probably um, uh, mummy-nized. Oh, wow. He was a mummy. Really? Mm-hmm. Whoa. It was the way you were buried yeah. in Egypt. Now, when you had said... Um, Joseph, I'm speaking. Uh, oh, yeah. When you when you'd said the, the Middle Age uh, the, about moving it mm-hmm. behind Ramsey, mm-hmm. 
I'm familiar with there being two different datings yes, for absolutely. potential datings That's for the, the uh, Exodus. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. And so you're saying it would be the one around the 1400s BC rather than the 1200s. Right. The Middle okay. Kingdom, because when the archaeologists dug and have are digging in the Middle Kingdom, mm-hmm. they find destruction. They find they found 20 to 30 thousand Semitic graves. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, they found people who appeared to be very prosperous, and then all of a sudden as if they were put in some kind of slavery and had a, a different diet and, mm-hmm. and had arthritis and uh, all kinds of ailments and mm-hmm. diseases all of a sudden. It was something drastic. And then they also found an enormous amount of children, especially mm-hmm. male children, who were really? killed in the graveyard. <laughs> that's, that's wild. Oh, my word. This is blowing my mind because I haven't See, heard about Bible's some of this. <laughs> the Bible and is I true. know you know that. Yeah, I mean, I, but, but to hear the, the, the data, where the data is building up, because I, I had a professor um, uh, when I went to Lee, great guy, great man, um, and he had, it was Old Testament professor Brian Peterson, mm-hmm. and he had said to me, he was like, uh, well, it was the whole class in general, it wasn't just to me preaching to me, mm-hmm. but he said, uh, archaeologists, when we had... So, just so you know, if you're listening, there's a school of interpreting the Bible that's become dominant now. It began with the Old Testament. It moved into the New Testament, and it started in Germany with German criticism. Mm-hmm. And these were actually literary experts. This was before, this is in the 1800s, before, actually late 1700s in the 1800s, before the field of archaeology ever took off. Mm-hmm. These German uh, critics, they fancied themselves, well, they didn't fancy themselves. They were good literary scholars, and they would break down prose and they would figure out how a body of text was developed. But they went and began to study the Old Testament, and one of the major different ways of breaking it up is a dominant one's documentary hypothesis, which is where you break up the Old Testament in the first five books of the Bible into five different uh, layers of writing. And they, they'll date what time period it, break up, it breaks up to, and, and they'll do it one of the uh, main ways that they determine that is the name of God that's used. Mm-hmm. Does it say Elohim? Does mm-hmm. it say yud heh vav heh What does it say? Or, or is it dealing with Levitical codes? Is it dealing more with uh, the history of Israel? So they'll try to say it was different periods of writing. But uh, I'm going into the detail, the tall grass, <laughs> but the main point is that was before anybody ever did archaeology. Then archaeologists started to look into Middle Eastern culture, and they found out that having multiple names for one deity has nothing to do with different writers, but it was ways that in Semitic culture, they gave honor to deity in some cultures to give multiple mm-hmm. different names, talk about different aspects of the deity. But that's just one example. Uh, the professor that we had, uh, he told us there in class, if these guys had uh, been born 100 years or 200 years later and had access to the data that archaeology was bringing, they probably never would have taken off and developed this whole school of thought. Mm-hmm. That's brilliantly said. Also, Matthew, this idea of German higher criticism uh, fueled by Darwinism really? um, actually led theologians to say that the Bible is allegorical, hmm. that it, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is mythical. He's there for moral lessons. Mm-hmm. But do you know what one of the leading archaeologists in the world say now, today? Right. We made a fool of German higher criticism. <laughs> really? So when he says that, what are the, the a little bit of the details that he well, would be talking Well, take for about. instance Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was not mentioned in any other archaeological find, mm-hmm. an ancient piece of literature except the scripture. So our critics in the community of faith, or against the community, our community of faith, mm-hmm. would say you can't trust the Bible because Nebuchadnezzar isn't a real human being. Neither is Pontius mm-hmm. Pilate, neither are the Hittites. And matter of fact, in the New York Times, they said uh, the Hittites no more signed a treaty with Egypt than the Choctaw Indians signed a treaty with the people of Manhattan. <laughs> Really? And they made fun of us at the turn mm-hmm. of the century. That kind of idea mm-hmm. rooted in Darwinism actually caused many people to lose their faith, including yeah. Reverend Charles Templeton. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, um, now we know that Nebuchadnezzar put, placed a brick on every building he built, and he is the builder of Babylon. He built the gates of Isidar. Mm-hmm. He built... Uh, um, the processional way. Mm-hmm. And every time he built a building, he put a plaque at the bottom of it with his name on it. Mm-hmm. So now we're finding hundreds. And what's so interesting to me is that when the London Museum, the British Museum of, of History opened up, and I love that place, mm-hmm. when it opened up, its first exhibit was the Garden of Eden. 
where they have dinosaur footprints on the same rock stratification as a human footprint that walks in pedal into a motion. What? Yes, absolutely. And right now we're finding thousands yeah. Of, of cases like that, not just in America, really? not just in Colorado, New Mexico, in, in uh, Turkestan, in Russia, um, all over the world we're finding yeah. that. And so um, biblical archae- or, or the biblical archaeology, archaeologists who dig amongst the ruins of biblical days mm-hmm. are finding proof, just like um, Sir William Ramsey took the Bible, went to look at where the Hittites were said to have lived, no other civilization in the history or any other mm-hmm. literature, excuse me, ever mentioned the Hittites people, but the Bible. Mm-hmm. He goes and digs where the Bible says they're at. He doesn't find one generation, Matthew. He found 11 of them. Oh, and when he walked into the first tomb of the kings of the Hittites, he found mm-hmm. the treaty between the Egyptians and the Hittites. And that is actually in the Istanbul Museum in Turkey. Oh, that's crazy. I love this stuff Whoa. because the, the faith is real. Yeah. At ISO, we always strive to provide discounts and incentives for our students. Now, we're thrilled to announce our best value ever, the ISO All Access Pass. For just $99 per month, any student can access our entire learning platform. An ever-expanding library of fascinating, groundbreaking teaching at your fingertips for the average price of just one ISO course. There has never been such a prime opportunity to pursue your biblical education. Students in many traditional schools pay $100 to learn every day for every single course. With the All Access Pass, that amount gives you access to our entire course catalog. At ISO, you can learn from world-class teachers on a wide variety of subjects, all at your own pace. With the subscription-based model of the All Access Pass, there are no obligations to put yourself in debt for decades. If you're hungry to learn about the Word, there's never been a better value. That's countless hours of teaching and materials with no limit on how much you can learn. Now, more than ever, ISO is excited to connect the Word with the world. Go to isow.org to get started with the All Access Pass today. So, uh, I I think about, um, I don't want to be choppy, jump back and forth here because I'm excited at the moment, but I think because I'm thinking about the facts and then the experience of of faith Uh, because the facts align with what the Word of God says, uh-huh. but uh, we didn't always have the facts. But we we did always have, uh, and when I say that, I mean yeah, we didn't always dream. we didn't always know. Yeah, we didn't always uncover the data, mm-hmm. but we did always have the power of the Holy Spirit. We we always had access to God. You know, right. we we always could have believed in the Scripture, and mm-hmm. then because you said earlier that young people. What makes their faith certain is an experience with God, a religious experience. One of those five, yes. Uh, before you'd come in, one of the guys on the production crew, Larry, I was like, why do you, because I was putting this up right here, uh-huh. saving the church, and yeah, we were talking about what you were going to be talking about today, uh-huh. and uh, uh, he had mentioned, he said, uh, he said that uh, it was because people were lacking the power of God, he felt, mm-hmm. that a lot of young people were leaving the church. And I, I said, uh, you know, you agree with that on a surface yeah. level. Yeah. You, you know, it, when you think about, I'm thinking about my own experience, love intellectual stuff, yes. love, uh, love talking about the facts of the Bible. I think some of the greatest people in the world, when it comes to, uh, the, reaffirming the word of God as legitimate history is a lot of Baptist universities. Uh-huh. Uh, there are great work done in the last hundred years by Baptist ministers and uh-huh. scholars. Uh, and I, I was, I went to a Baptist school, private school growing up, a very, a small thing, but it was a great education. So very thankful uh-huh. for that. But what solidified, uh, me remaining in the faith was my personal walk with Jesus. Uh-huh. Cause it was the thought of, I could not live I, could, I, do, I don't want to be alive mm-hmm. if Jesus isn't who he says he is. Because mm-hmm. the love I've experienced from God mm-hmm. is greater than any fact I could ever learn. Mm-hmm. Now, everybody at some point in their life, I think, is like gets in their own head and they're like, is this true or is this not true? That's you a have, stage of faith. Yeah. It's a, one of the faith stages. I'm sorry, Matthew. Oh, you're fine. No, no. Yeah. I want you to talk to this interview. Yeah, no. Yeah. And, and that is so true. But that's why I agree with James K. A. Smith that you have to... N- love before mm-hmm. you can know mm-hmm. that the more I love God the more I know about him the more I understand archaeology the more I understand social sciences of faith development the more mm-hmm. I understand faith stages and uh, it, it brings my faith alive 
you've got to love him first. You've got to fall mm -hmm. in love with him. And that is a religious experience. Mm -hmm. That is tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, mm -hmm. that he can change lives. But you will eventually, most all people, unless they get stuck in a faith stage, which is quite possible. Mm -hmm. You can be 40 and stuck in a place religiously where you should be at 15. Mm -hmm. um, most people go to a place like I did where I started questioning God. And the more education you get, the more you will. But what I want to encourage people is that there are academic, spiritual people who believe what you believe, that know how to defend their faith, but you've got to look for them. Mm -hmm. In other words, if all you ever listen to is, is Richard Dawkins, if all yeah. you ever listen to are atheists and agnostics mm -hmm. and, and knocking God and, and all the lies on the Internet, don't get me started on that, you're going to be in some big trouble. But if you can find C.S. Lewis, if you can mm -hmm. find some of the great intellectual minds of the faith that have studied um, questions about how can a good God allow evil and suffering? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know the Bible's true? Um, how do you know Jesus is the only way to God? Mm -hmm. No one ever told me he was the only one who ever claimed to be God. Buddha never claimed to be God. Mm -hmm. Muhammad never claimed to be God. He was the only one ever claimed to be God. And so you connect your intellectual journey with your spiritual faith. But the problem in academia, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is that we have disconnected the experience with the academics. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you mm -hmm. really are educated as a Christian, it brings humility in your life. Mm -hmm. Because you realize how great God is and what kind of all God has. But when you get puffed up and arrogant because you're educated, mm -hmm. you have lost the reason for education. Wow. Who You know, um, as, I, as I went to college, uh, I've, if you've been in the Lord's presence before mm -hmm. and you've known what it's like to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, then you know that there is a, there's a component of it where you have to release your own understanding and trust in the Lord. You know, whatever, uh, in a Pentecostal church, if they pray for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, yeah. because everybody always talks about the stereotypes. People say, hold on, let go. Yeah. You know, nobody knows exactly how it works. But you do know that you, you can't be so in your head about understanding the supernatural thing that's about to happen that you, you don't allow yourself to yield to what the Holy Spirit's doing. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a, a sense in where you have to trust the Holy Spirit when you have no understanding. Like Paul even said in 1 Corinthians 14 about speaking in tongues, your mind's unfruitful when you begin to speak in tongues. So when God works, and, and even when the prophetic word comes, there's oftentimes people will make statements. You don't even understand exactly what you're saying. The Apostle Peter, he said that the prophet that didn't fully understand what they talked about at all times. So there's a trust in God. But when um, I started to get into academics, and I hope this, this can help some students that are listening, uh, there was a, a weird phenomenon that I was feeling about sp the balance between spiritual things and academic things. Because mm. I, I knew I was figuring problems out with my mind, and it was for my faith. Mm -hmm. But I, I was noticing, I was perceiving almost a wall that could easily happen between this, the Spirit of God speaking to me mm -hmm. and me having my own understanding, working things out. And I was confused by it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know why it was happening. I was like, Lord, I'm here to learn these things at this Christian mm -hmm. university for you. Mm -hmm. But it seems like there are, there are times where uh, this information isn't helping me have an easier time in the prayer closet, mm -hmm. having an easier time having an easier time in my spiritual walk, if that makes sense. I'm trying to describe mm -hmm. something here. Mm -hmm. um, and I was trying to figure out what it was. I wondered, if, is it pride? Is it a tendency to rely on my own understanding instead of relying on the Lord? And I hope I'm making sense yeah, here. Yeah, you are. Um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul mentions to them that they were so, that they're experiencing the spiritual gifts, but he says to them that they're getting so prideful that they're not able to understand the heart of the gospel anymore. Mm -hmm. um, is it, how, how do you, someone who gets into academics keep from losing their spiritual walk? You have to have intimacy with the deity. 
And if all you know is head knowledge mm-hmm. and it's not driven by love for, a, uh, for, for Christ, you get into big trouble. And I see a lot of Christian professors like that. Mm-hmm. They're rather arrogant. They know everything about the Bible and nothing about a personal walk with Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And that is a journey. That is a wall. That is a ditch. That is a trial. That is a uh, test Mm -hmm. that everyone who engages in academic or education must go through. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you begin to realize it turns into awe. It did Mm -hmm. for me anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, this question, this question, this question, this question, this question, this question. Well, how do you you stay uh, tied to the root? Mm. How do you stay tied to love, loving God? And that is you you have a personal walk with God. Mm -hmm. And I think theology that isn't practical can get in a lot of danger. Mm -hmm. Because practicality of winning a soul or making a disciple, in my theological understanding, actually is one of the reasons why I dig deeper for academics, why I dig deeper in in the academy or in academic journals. Mm is because I'm inside a world that's asking questions. Mm-hmm. My 10-year-old raised in church said, Dad, you said God is good. Yeah, that's right. He said, then why is there suffering? Wow. Um, you pray and you pray and you pray mm-hmm. and you get people who are involved in hyper-faith, which I am not a part of. No disrespect to anyone. But God doesn't heal your grandmother of cancer. You pull on your academic knowledge, your rational ability to critically think, and you intermingle that with faith. But mm-hmm. if it's the root of that isn't a personal, deep, passionate love for Jesus, all you have is a bunch of head knowledge. Mm-hmm. But I experienced God. I watched God change my mother's life, my father's mm-hmm. life, my family's life for that mm-hmm. part. I, I, I saw God do unbelievable things and he touched me in a way that I cannot ever rationalize out Mm -hmm. I cannot be so deep in critical thinking that I say oh that was just an emotional experience I'm at a place Matthew where I am now went back to religious experiences and started reading everything I can on neurological studies Mm -hmm. especially amongst religious experiences from dr andrew newberg at the university of pennsylvania Mm -hmm. he did the first he put the first person who speaks in tongues under a form of an mri and the place in your brain that lights up when you speak and you're speaking language lights up Mm -hmm. but the place that has the actual verbal speech is dormant so when you speak in tongues you're speaking Mm -hmm. a language but you're not speaking a language your your brain understands wow (laughs) <laughs> I, I saw that study years ago on the news, actually. Yeah, 1990. Yeah. But now it has evolved in such a place that your entire being, mm-hmm. this idea that, oh, there's a God gene, and that uh, we are religious because um, it was some form of the survival of the fittest, whatever. Mm-hmm. That's a lie. Because you, you're, you're, one part of your brain does not work in a religious experience. Mm-hmm. All of your brain works in a religious experience. So it's almost as if your whole body was created as a, as a phone mm-hmm. for God to communicate to human beings. Hmm. A phone for God to communicate to human beings. Wow. See, now I'm, I'm processing these things because you're dropping some, <laughs> some pretty big stuff. That's all. So you're saying that, I, and I've heard uh, a group of people mention this. Actually, I'm going to talk about this guy a lot. I just listen to George Peterson a lot because yeah. he's like at the center of culture right now. But he mentioned uh, that research in psychology has begun to show that Human beings are designed for religious experience. And I people, believe that. there are literally chemicals in the brain that are released commonly when people are having a religious experience no, that's across true. the board. So, well, could you dive oh, a little bit more into details yeah, about this? Well, you talk about Andrew Newberg at the University of Pennsylvania. When we pray, when he put someone mm-hmm. who was praying, yeah. just a simple mm-hmm. prayer, not passionate. It wasn't much brain change. Really? But when you begin to pray fervently, mm-hmm. as our community of faith would say, intercede uh-huh. or um, uh, get happy, the mm-hmm. old saints used to say, <laughs> or yeah. uh, speak in tongues, your brain changed. But your brain not only changed for the better, but it actually releases after a good cry or after a deep prayer chemicals that relieve stress in your body. Really? 
Yeah, your whole body. It's almost like religious <laughs> that's experience. Crazy. And so that's why what? it's so dangerous to have academics without a love for God, uh -huh. with a religious experience. And I'm not talking about goofiness. No mm -hmm. one hates goofiness more than I do. Yeah. But that doesn't remove the fact that he's a baptizer. It doesn't mm -hmm. remove the fact that the Bible is the word of God and that he speaks to me and I can sense his presence because mm -hmm. he's given me the ability to do that neurologically. Wow. You know what? That That's amazing because I think what frustrated me so much was people will talk. Uh, there's a, a proverb that says, "Much with much wisdom comes much sorrow. Yes. And it's yes. the idea of when you deal with people's problems at a at a an exponential rate when so much of it is being laid on you you can be overwhelmed with sorrow because you have more problems than you can solve mm -hmm. and so I, I know that people when we were in uh when i was in school people always want to be looking at the news always want to be mm -hmm. uh helping with the world getting involved with what, what's ever going on but we're just humans you know we can't do everything out there and i remember having this overwhelming feeling of i feel like there's so much cynicism in academia Academics and in schooling, mm -hmm. because people haven't figured out what David seemed to figure out in the pro in, in the Psalms, which is he'll begin with his problems. He will mm -hmm. have his, his list of problems, and he'll talk to God about it, and he'll be real upset. But then he usually turns around and reminds himself of what God has done for him. You've done this. You've kept this promise. And I know that you're going to come around and you are going to save us from this situation. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get that second half, there's a hopelessness. There's a mm -hmm. cynicism. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the same hopelessness that's overwhelming people in universities right now. That's right. Because they don't have a solution for so many of these problems. But God is the one that has the solution. You're talking about the way that the brain works, mm -hmm. that you, you cry, you have, this, you have this time where you're laying down serious problems with God, right. but God's designed there to be an answer to it, a faith right. that rises. Mm -hmm. Hope, that's right. That, um, that whole idea that, that um, you have an experience with God and it roots and embeds belief in you. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating to me, and what worries me the most is that we have so many people in Pentecostal charismatic circles who are diminishing religious experiences. We're creating church cultures, and I get it. I got to get cars out and mm -hmm. in within 35, mm -hmm. 45 minutes. I get that world. However, I also know what Chris Hodges has recently said is that we're going to allow more time for God to move. Mm -hmm. So I need an extra 15 minutes. <laughs> because you wow. have to give time and space for God. And I think the root of that, Matthew, is that we've got, and here I go back to James K. A. Smith, we have discipleship wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not that I know in order to love. Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 uh, I love in order to know that when I... Um, love God and I study God, it, it isn't because I, I don't get closer to God through information. Mm -hmm. Information doesn't sanctify you mm -hmm. in, in most cases. Information fills you with lots of great things in the grandeur of God. And I, I'm trying to be very careful here. The problem is that we don't give time for this generation to experience God. We don't do it in our churches. Mm -hmm that is rooted and grounded in a lie from Descartes that says, I think, therefore I am. When the truth is, it's impossible to have a rational thought mm -hmm. without the emotional center of your brain being involved. Harvard knows that, and people who sell cars know that. It's time for the church to relearn it, to understand that it's not either or, or excuse me, it's not either or, it's both mm -hmm. and, that we mm -hmm. need knowledge and we need a religious experience that's going to sell our faith and we're creating just the opposite mm -hmm. and that is contributing to the deconstruction of faith so a kid can know every book of the bible they can go to and no pun intended they can go to bible quiz competitions mm -hmm. they can they can get a true love weight ring but at the end of the day until they experience god till mm -hmm. hot tears roll down their eyes mm -hmm. until a living God becomes a real reality to them. Mm. What they know doesn't matter. Wow. What they I, now I'm speechless <laughs> because I'm like because that's true. What they what they know doesn't matter. I've heard. Uh, I, I remember growing up in churches and people would talk about uh, if you go to a Bible class or a, a Sunday school, it's like Lord, we're going to learn more about you, and therefore we're going to love you more. 
You know, Matthew, you asked when we began this about my conversion experience. Mm -hmm. And I won't tell the details because it's too sensational. But I'm 55 with, I'm a couple of weeks away from two earned doctorates. Mm -hmm. And they were earned from very prestigious universities. It was an experience at the Con Center hmm. at Lee University where I surrendered my life to God. And Lamar Vest laid hands on me. And I had a religious experience that I cannot understand to this day. I was on stage with Lamar Vest laying hands on me in the con center. And I woke up on the bottom of the floor hmm. down in what we would call the orchestra pit or the uh, 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 altar area. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I got there. I don't remember anything. I remember what happened to me when I saw something that I can't explain to this day. Mm -hmm. And no amount of education will erase that from me. But every time I get just a little bit more knowledge and I mingle that with that religious experience, God becomes more precious to me. Huh. And so my greatest prayer is that we would return to bringing our children and this generation and people to a place where they can experience God with great academics. Hmm. Well, this is our part one of this video. This has been powerful, and especially in this last few moments where I feel like the Lord has wrapped up this episode full circle. Our focus here uh, with Dr. Knight in these episodes, these two ones, is returning to the Lord, I think. Mm -hmm. we, we have here on this uh, the cinema board, saving the church, saving the church, but Right now, what you're saying to me reminds me of what the prophet said to Israel is remember, remember mm -hmm. what the Lord has done for you. Mm -hmm. If you remember, then you can return. Mm -hmm. And what we need now mm -hmm. is not just more information, but every time we learn something new, taking it and anchoring it mm -hmm. into the original encounter mm -hmm. that brought us to God. Exactly right. Mm -hmm.